The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good morning and good afternoon to my early birds. We are uh, about five minutes away from starting the broadcast, so stay tuned. And I appreciate you uh, staking your claim early on. Good morning, all. Thanks for the early bird attendees. We've got about 10% of our registered guests. There we go, we're getting some numbers now. We're about four minutes away from beginning the broadcast. Good deal. Thanks folks for tuning in early. We're gonna begin in about three minutes and uh, I look forward to uh, answering your questions at the end of the broadcast. Good morning, all. We're about two minutes away from going live. Again, I appreciate uh, everyone that has uh, dialed in early. Um, I recognize a lot of the names here and I appreciate uh, you dialing in.
Good morning and good afternoon, everybody, and, and uh, welcome to the second Parts Trader Industry Update. I'm your host, Greg Horn. Uh, once again, thank you very kindly for joining the update. Um, I am humbled by the number of people uh, that have uh, signed up to listen to me talk. My wife is stunned by the fact that people would listen to me talk about parts and collision industry trends for uh, for the next hour. So let's go with diving right in. And we're gonna start off with a look at the uh, length of rental, comparing the fourth quarter of 2019 to the fourth quarter of 2020. Uh, this information, of course, comes to us from our partners at Enterprise Rent-A-Car. And as you may have heard in my uh, commentary to Collision Week about this trend, this is really interesting to me. The fact that despite we had uh, having a reduction of about 20% of claims volume in the fourth quarter of 2020 compared to the fourth quarter of 2019, we saw the exact uh, national uh, length of rental being 13.1 for repairable vehicles. We also, in the commentary in, in Collision Week, mentioned that we measure at Parts Trader the uh, supply chain in two main measures, and it's the average quote per part to see if the entire infrastructure, the OE, the aftermarket, and the recyclers are bidding uh, on those parts frequently. And it was a very robust, in fact, identical to the fourth quarter of 2019 as far as number of quotes. The second thing we look at is the average delivery time quoted for the supplier who wins that bid. And that was identical to the fourth quarter of 2019 as well. So the infrastructure was very robust. We know that the parts supply was robust. And we look at, at some pretty stable numbers uh, as far as state level with two exceptions. And we'll call out Louisiana and Colorado as being uh, changes to the negatives and the positives. But what I'm left with is the fact that it looks like we did not have enough technicians in the repair shop being able to speed up the uh, repair time, even though there was a reduction by about 20% of incoming repair volume. It looks like this just wasn't a, a fully staffed collision market in the fourth quarter of 2020. And that's what uh, resulted in this uh, stable rental time. Now, as we move on to uh, more parts related pieces, we will uh, look at the average number of parts per estimate. And, you know, this is the average number of parts on a repairable estimate is about 10.2 for the estimates going through the parts trader system and that tracks fairly well with the industry as a whole it's around 10 2 to 10 5 depending on the time of year uh, the interesting thing is that when you look at the breakdown the oem portion of that is still 5.4 parts and that's oem without a price match or conquest available uh, then we get a very small portion at 0.2 of a part where there is a surplus oem available and aftermarket at 2.9 with recycled at less than one part on average. The really interesting thing about this is, and I mentioned it in, in one of my recent blogs, um, that if you're looking at a lot of uh, parts identification mechanisms, some vendors out there, all they're going to be doing is focusing on the recycled and the aftermarket and bringing over the benchmark list price for those parts. Uh, the blog was titled, "Are you is your, your parts platform only finding a portion of what it should? And this is what I mean by that, is that you are getting, uh, if you're looking at some of the traditional uh, parts locating mechanisms, they're just bringing over catalog pricing for recycled and aftermarket. And we can see in this chart, the absolute majority is OEM. And what we have coined the term competitive tension in our uh, parts trader system is the fact that we are providing competition bidding parties, suppliers on OEM 
OEM with price match, OEM surplus, aftermarket, and recycled for all part types. As we break that down further, we look at the average number of quotes per part by U.S. region. So this is a full U.S. look at the map. And you can see, again, this is full year 2020. And this is for all parts on the estimate. So that's everything from the, the OEM grill emblem to the aftermarket grill to that used hood or that, that uh, used headlamp assembly. So it is a true all parts type look. And it's a great way to measure um, what the you know the measure the robustness if that's a word of the bidding system okay whoops then as we break it down to the uh, top vehicles so this is the top number of vehicles the top 10 vehicles by vehicle make and model that are coming through the parts trader system. And it's it it's a, a mirror image of what the makeup of all the estimates in the US look like. Obviously, Toyota Camry's number one, Civic's number two, Cord's number three. What I look at here is is pretty interesting because when I look at these charts, I see that again, this is for all parts. So it's everything from the emblem to the the major components, that there's a really robust uh, representation of vehicles and, and part supply across all makes. And when you look at this, you see two obviously uh, interesting outliers. Number five, the Nissan Altima has by far, you know, 7.7 .7 quotes per part on every part, which is pretty incredible. That's a pretty robust supply. The antithesis of that is the Ford F-150. And that's still coming in at just around three and a half quotes per part for every part. And you say, well, why is the F-150 so much lower than the average and so much lower than all the rest? And the answer really is that since 2015, you know, the, the structure of that F-150 has been aluminum, or as Ford will tell you, military grade aluminum alloy. Um, and the aftermarket uh, suppliers and, and manufacturers really have not embraced a lot of manufacture of aluminum parts for that F-150. So this is a lot of OE-centric competition, um, but still very robust at, at uh, just around three and a half quotes per part, including all of those aluminum components. Okay. Let's move on to the next. All right, as we look at the average quote of the top 10 replacement parts, and this is uh, by, by part category. So most popular is front headlamps at 11.8 quotes per part, and that's for all vehicles across. So we, uh, we average just under 12 quotes per front headlamp. That is really important because obviously it's one of the most replaced parts in a collision repair. Um, and the headlamps are actually a, a component where there is an incredible amount of margin and markup. Um, and a little piece of trivia that the 2015 to 2017 Kia K900 holds the record for having the most expensive headlamp component with an MSRP OE list of $3,749 per headlamp for the new OE. Now, obviously, um, competitiveness like 12, just under 12 bids means that that price that is uh, on the estimate as a list price, it, whether it's a recycled component or an OE component is being substantially less than that. Now we're gonna switch gears a little bit and look at the automotive industry as a whole and give you a couple of updates. And I like to start with global trends um, and then we're gonna look some sales trends and then switch to look at some new vehicles and what they'll mean for the collision market. So the 2020 global sales numbers are in, and for the first time in a very long time, in fact, since 2015, Toyota Motor Sales globally outsold Volkswagen Group um, by a substantial amount. And the, the 
reason that Toyota beat out Volkswagen in 2015 was very obvious. It was the start of the diesel gate where they were prohibited from selling new diesel vehicles uh, across the globe. So what was the difference here in 2020? It was the fact that VW sells substantially more cars in Europe uh, than Toyota, and the share is, is switched in North America. Toyota sells substantially more of a market share than does VW. And in Europe, the lockdowns were more uh, severe and longer. And we have in the US and in Canada, uh, penchant for doing a lot of our car buying and car researching online. And in Europe, it's still mostly done in person. So there wasn't that ability to pivot as quickly to go to virtually touch-free virtual sales uh, in Europe that we were uh, very quick to turn and do and still do uh, a lot of virtual sales and deliveries uh, online. So that was really what, what caused uh, VW to lag in global sales in 2020. And the interesting thing is that Toyota has become very bullish on 2020 vehicle sales. In fact, they've sent out communications to their tier one and tier two suppliers that they are planning for record output across the globe for Toyota manufacturers. So they are looking at 2021 sales rebounding significantly um, and producing record uh, number of vehicles to meet that demand. Interestingly now too, that Tesla in the US in 2020 overtook Audi as now it's the fourth largest luxury selling brand uh, in the U.S. and it outpaced uh, Audi by just about 17,000 units. That is interesting. That is the first time, obviously, a, a full electric vehicle brand has has broken that uh, 200,000 vehicle sales uh, in a year. The other thing is that for repairers and insurers, this is going to point an even brighter light on the shortcomings of the Tesla collision repair infrastructure, the supply of parts, which they've really, really been sorely lacking. They have to invest a significant amount in that collision parts infrastructure if they are gonna continue to hold this type of market share and really focus on customer satisfaction. When we look at, at the CSI related to Tesla, it is remarkably high with the exception of collision repair. Interestingly, to give you an idea of how tight this spread is, uh, third place Mercedes was 265,000 sales in 2020, BMW at 270, and you can see that Lexus takes the top at about 275,000 units. The other really interesting thing is that as we uh, look at the vehicle brands mentioned here, you can see that the Audi, Mercedes, and BMW manufacturers are going full bore to get competitive in the e full e vehicle, EV vehicle market against Lexus. And Lexus Toyota Group really is not coming out with uh, a large full electric vehicle offering as of yet. And more Tesla news, which is rather interesting. Um, you see that for the first time in 2020, they earned a record profit of $721 million, uh, which is really quite remarkable. Um, now, it's interesting, too, that it's the Model Y that has become the top seller. Uh, so far in, in 2020. And the other interesting thing is they went from an $862 million loss the previous year in 2019 to a $721 million profit in 2020. However, um, the uh, help that Tesla got was their ability to sell emissions credits to other manufacturers selling vehicles in North America that were not able to meet uh, their emission uh, requirements and they could sell credits and they actually uh, it was quite a profitable business for them and it always kind of makes me scratch my head 
why a full electric vehicle manufacturer has emission credits to begin with to sell, but that's another question for another day. Um, interestingly, that the Model Y is the top selling over the Model 3. The Model 3 is their sedan. It is much less expensive than the Model Y. If you look at that Model Y, it is a crossover vehicle. We see, have seen the trend from Ford going away from passenger vehicles. A lot of the uh, companies, Volkswagen is discontinuing the Passat after next year to focus on their SUVs and crossover vehicles. And even uh, as this becomes the most popular Tesla, it's going to face some pretty stiff competition from the Mustang Mach-E, which is the car I mentioned in, in our last broadcast, which is that full EV vehicle. And if you look, my gosh, they're strikingly similar in their appearance. And both Tesla and Ford have reduced their pricing, their MSRP of these models to compete within about $5 of each other on similar equipped models. So we'll watch as that goes uh, to see who actually sells more vehicles, Ford or, you know, through the Mach-E or the, the Tesla Model Y. Now, if you guys are uh, of my age, hopefully you're not, maybe a little bit younger, uh, you'll remember quite fondly the Ford Maverick. Uh, this vehicle was introduced in the fall of 1969. You can see that beautiful bright orange with the uh, yellow and green plaid interior. These usually came with a straight six Mustang, but in 71, they added a 302 V8. And they were very, very popular and very low price for, for this size of a car to come in at just under $2,000 uh, for the base model was pretty impressive. Um, this represented a very good value when you could buy it in the, the Maverick Grabber version with the 302 V8. Uh, it was actually faster in a zero to 60 time than the same model year of Mustang. Uh, so that was the hot tip. It weighed about 700 pounds less than a Mustang and had the same power plant in the base with the 302. Um, I've gone down the rabbit hole of talking about old Ford Mavericks, but Ford has reintroduced the brand. Um, and again, I mentioned this because they have stepped away from passenger car production to truck and SUV and crossover production, almost exclusively following the US customer taste. Um, when you see these vehicles, you'll go, wow, what size is this vehicle? It looks pretty impressive. This vehicle is slated to come in under size of the existing Ford Ranger. So it is about two thirds the size of the Ford Ranger. So it is a very small pickup. It comes with a base model of a 1.3 cylinder or 1.3 liter three cylinder engine in a front wheel drive configuration. It is a unibody construction vehicle. The option and required if you get the all wheel drive is the two liter four cylinder. And there is some talk about putting an inline six uh, for the higher end models. But add another decimal on that because this will come in like the last Ford Maverick is a very reasonably priced car. This time it'll be $19,995. We had mentioned that uh, Kia had very expensive headlamps in our earlier slide about the uh, the front lamp uh, competition in Parts Trader. Uh, and I had mentioned the Kia 900, and that is a casualty of slow sales in the US. Kia will pivot again. You can see these are the left, uh, what they call sedans. I'd call that sole somewhat of a sedan but they have the smaller vehicles, the Rio, the Forte, the K5, and the high performance Stinger left in the US. As of uh, 2021, you'll no longer be able to buy a K900. Um, they only sold 305 last year, which is the reason I think they're axing that high priced car. And they're also axing in the Kia Cadenza. So again, as manufacturers pivot towards mo more crossovers and SUVs, that's important in the collision repair and insurance markets because crossovers and SUVs behave differently in a collision. On average, there is 0.5 more parts, so just under half a part more uh, for a crossover or SUV than it is, would have been damaged and needed to be replaced with a similar sedan. So 
that translates into slightly higher repair costs for us. Uh, not backing away fully from the sedan offerings, this is the new Cadillac CT5V Blackwing. This will actually come with a variant of the LS3, I believe, with 668 horsepower, mated to a six-speed manual transmission. Yes, folks, a manual transmission in a Cadillac. This will be, the Blackwing will be the last gasoline-powered model in Cadillac's V lineup as they pivot towards electric vehicles. Also of note is that over 170 Cadillac dealers uh, have chosen to be bought out of their franchise agreements rather than convert to electric vehicle uh, sales and repair because Cadillac is the first of the General Motors brands to pivot towards a full EV lineup and there was a rather significant investment needed by Cadillac dealers to make that transition to both charging, servicing, selling, and repairing uh, of electric vehicles. And you've seen a lot of Cadillac dealers uh, respectfully decline. So interesting um, that this is sort of the last gasp of the high-performance V-Series. For those of you in the market, um, the range will be from 89.9 to 113.5 which is pretty substantial. Uh, these things will be incredibly fast with that 668 horsepower. Um, the only thing I think would be faster uh, with his vehicle is the depreciation from that MSRP list price. New vehicle sales for January and what it means for us. Um, just down under 1% to a million vehicle sales in January 2020, which is incredibly uh, high. I mean, there are a lot of people getting out and getting back into purchasing of vehicles in uh, January 2021. Um, when adjusted for selling days, we're only about 1% variance. Now, the interesting thing is based initially, the seasonally adjusted annual sales rate was projected to be 16.3 million vehicles. Just within the last week, that has been revised downward to 15.5 million vehicles. And that could go substantially lower. And the reason that is, is there is a global microchip shortage uh, that we are now in the automotive and we will soon see in the collision industry impacting length of rental, repairability, parts availability when there is a microchip associated with that collision repair part. And it can be something as simple as a door handle with a touch pad or, or uh, touch entry for the keyless entry vehicles. You've seen uh, news recently that most manufacturers have curtailed or completely stopped production, citing microchip availability. Ford with their best-selling vehicle, the F-150, has, has cut two shifts from Ford F-150 production, which is pretty incredible. Um, so I believe as we see the uh, production curtailed, we'll see a shortage of sales, but also the potential impact on new collision parts with microchips in them and impacting the, the cycle time and the length of rental as we go forward. Now you say, well, how did this happen? And the interesting thing, and you can read a little bit more detail uh, in my blog about the, the microchip shortage. Last April, we had a good supply uh, and a little bit of a surplus in, in global microchip uh, production. Um, the interesting thing is consumer demand in, and led somewhat by the work at home phenomena created by the COVID-19. There was an increased demand for cell phones for folks that needed um, additional work lines on, in a hurry. There was also the idea that we are cooped up and buying more gaming systems, gaming devices, and new gaming systems being released in uh, around the, the holiday season. That gobbled up any sort of excess capacity for microchips. Meanwhile, while that was ramping up to meet demand, Automotive manufacturers were sort of the last to resume production. And when they started coming back online, they realized they were all of a sudden at the back of the line for 
uh, production or for, for the ability to, to buy parts. So what's going to happen next? Uh, Taiwan, interestingly enough, because they are the biggest producer of aftermarket parts, is also one of the largest manufacturers of semiconductors and microchips in the world. Now, uh, the Taiwan Semiconductor Manufacturing Company has made a huge investment in the US trying to build a plant in North Phoenix in Arizona. Now, they broke ground uh, earlier in 2020, but it will take a significant amount of time to bring this gigantic North Phoenix production field facility up to snuff. In the meantime, uh, the administration, US administration, is looking at other sources around the world to help offset any shortage that is encountered by the vehicle manufacturers. And so we'll, we'll potentially see uh, a return if we're able to meet in countries other than Taiwan and mainland China, uh, the, the excess demand that's, that's posed by the US auto industry. Now we're gonna talk about Stellantis. Um, and <laughs> I put this up here, ask your doctor if Stellantis is right for you, because when I hear the name Stellantis, I instantly think of one of those commercials for a medication of, uh, that shows people doing their everyday routines with a big smile on their face, and then a long list of, of potentially fatal side effects. But Stellantis in this case is not a, a pharmaceutical, it is the name of the new merger of Fiat Chrysler and Peugeot Group. Um, so this is an interesting marriage of sorts. And let's look, take a minute to look and see what this uh, marriage of, of these two groups brings to, to the marketplace. Uh, FCA, Fiat Chrysler Automobiles, brings Maserati at the luxury near supercar market. It brings a premium with SUVs and sports cars with Alfa Romeo. Of course, uh, SUVs, uh, the, the most valuable brand arguably in the FCA group is the Jeep brand. In the passenger car and multi-purpose multi vehicle, there's Chrysler, Dodge, Fiat to a lesser extent. And then Lancia uh, is a brand that used to be sold in, up until the mid seventies in the US but now is sold exclusively in Italy, but it is still a somewhat revered brand uh, being slightly badge engineered Fiat's, but still it, it carries a lot of cachet. On the truck and uh, light commercial vehicle market, it's split between Ram and Fiat Professional. Um, Fiat Professional, uh, to give you an idea, every current model, uh, Dodge Ram is actually a Fiat Ducato. So the, the Fiat Ducato commercial vehicle is the Ram Sprinter. Um, PSA Group is an interesting conglomeration of groups. Uh, in the premium class, they are represented by DS Automobiles. DS Automobiles are full EV versions of uh, the Citroen C5 which is, and C6, which are medium to large size luxury automobiles. And these are full EV uh, vehicles that are produced and sold in, in France and, and the rest of Europe. In the passenger car market, they bring Peugeot vehicles, Citroën vehicles, and they recently purchased from General Motors the German brand Opel and the UK uh, brand Vauxhall, uh, bringing those into the group. So that kind of gives you the idea. They'll be selling vehicles in more than 130 countries, but why? Do why did this marriage happen? And what survives more importantly? And, and the main thing to remember is that Stellantis by, by making this, this marriage will become the fourth largest automaker in the world by volume. So really, really interesting to see um, what that means for uh, the market in the US. Interestingly, if you look at the two, what I think are the two most vulnerable nameplates are Chrysler and Dodge. Uh, Chrysler sold over 110,000 vehicles, which is not really a lot, mainly because they only currently have two vehicles to sell. That's the aging Chrysler 300 and the Pacifica minivan. If you remember, um, Dodge discontinued the Grand Caravan 
They also discontinued the journey crossover after a very long and successful run. Um, but with all of these nameplates, the Durango, the Challenger, the Charger, and the Caravan and Journey, they sold 267,000 vehicles. Now they're going to have to figure out how they can get to that number or get close to it with just the Dodge Durango, the Aging Charger, and the Aging Challenger. Now, a lot of uh, Dodge and Chrysler dealers also sold Fiat vehicles, but Fiat discontinued US sales of all of its vehicles except for that 500X crossover four door. Um, and I wondered if anybody noticed that they discontinued the 500 in the US because they really hadn't been selling any uh, any volume in the last couple of years. The interesting thing is though that on the Peugeot side, the PSA side, other brands are looking at entering the US market. Uh, CEO of, of uh, Stellantis, Carlos Tavares said that Peugeot will plan to re-enter the US market in a highly unconventional, not traditional way which I think is code for the French way. Um, and with an emphasis on frugality. And I really, really wonder what that means. If it, if it means that these are gonna be competitively priced vehicles, we'll wait and see. Uh, if you recall, uh, Peugeot last sold new cars in the US in 1991 and to jog your memory, this was the, one of the largest selling Peugeots at the time in 1991. This is the Peugeot 505 turbo diesel. This is a vehicle that you could uh, measure the 0 to 60 time with a sundial. It was incredibly slow. The other one here is a Peugeot 405. I actually snapped this picture myself two years ago in, uh, in New York City in Brooklyn. This car was in its native habitat on the street marking its territory with an oil stain. But those were the last Peugeots sold new in the US. Um, but fast forward a significant number of years, and you can see that we are uh, looking at the current model lineup, and this will give you the, the top and bottom end. This is the seven passenger vehicle, the Peugeot 5008, <coughs> excuse me. And then on the lower end, in the micro car, near micro car, this is about the size of a Chevy Spark. This is the Peugeot 208, and they have a variant, a high performance called the 208 GTI. Um, really interesting to see what this unconventional way into the U.S. market will mean. So let's stay tuned. The idea is that they will enter the market by 2024 or 25. Now, interestingly enough, uh, back to more talk about EVs, um, because there is a lot of news around EVs, not only the, the uh, Teslas of the world, and we mentioned about how the German manufacturers, Audi, uh, Mercedes, and BMW are, are, are betting big on EV, EV vehicles. GM has also made a pledge, Mary Barra, the CEO, said that they were going to be exclusively electric vehicles by 2035, um, with a commitment to offer 30 new global electric vehicles by 2025, with the flagship being Cadillac. So serious are they in getting the news out that they've actually changed their logo for the first time in 50 years. This is supposed to um, uh, evoke the idea that it's an electric plug. I guess that uh, M on the new GM logo looks a little bit like a, a, an outlet plug, but um, interesting nonetheless that they have bet the farm literally uh, on electric vehicles and are being very aggressive. So in the collision industry, as we look at what does EV production mean, um, it is going to be really interesting to look at, is there going to be, are these vehicles going to be manufactured with a serviceable battery? Um, because most of the floor pan in these vehicle manufacturers architecture is that the floor of the vehicle is entirely taken up by the battery. Um, and as we know, there are a lot of claims we've received over the years of road debris being kicked up through the floorboard of vehicles, people driving off roads and, and uh, damaging the, the floor pan of the vehicle. So it will be really interesting to see what it looks like um, 
in the next five years to see this advent of vehicles in do we call out the manufacturers that do not have a serviceable floor pan battery as being uh, a higher risk and potentially being paying higher premiums than those that do? Um, also, interestingly, GM has a subsidiary called Bright Drop, which is a commercial vehicle fleet company uh, manufacturing these vehicles. Um, and this is coming about very, very quickly. Um, and the reason I wanted to mention this is that it comes around so quickly that you've got to hope that they have a, a better infrastructure than Tesla does in servicing the parts of these vehicles in the collision repair environment. Because as we know, if you look at most FedEx trucks, there's usually some repairable damage on most of the FedEx trucks you see driving down the road. Um, and if you're betting big, uh, FedEx uh, fairly tepid with an order of 500 initial vans. Uh, Merchant's fleet, however, ordered 12,600 of these vans. Um, and they will start building these in Ontario, Canada through the, in the GM plant. Um, but it'll be interesting to see how GM being, you know, having a, a great existing uh, parts distribution mechanism infrastructure in the U.S., in Canada, how they will meet the demand for these vehicles. Uh, the other thing of note is that you can see in the lower right that delivery driver is actually pulling the uh, other interesting development by Bright Drop, which is a fully electric pallet. So that is a motorized electric pallet with start stop capability. You pull on a yoke handle and uh, those boxes open up and are unloadable and you can see it loading into the side of that vehicle. So interesting stuff. And uh, that's really all of the content I had. And what I'd like to do is open it up for questions. Um, so if you grab, if you will, um, we have a couple of questions already. Hang on one sec as I open this pane a little bit more. Um, and Ken Weiss has asked a couple of questions here. Let me expand. Hang on one second. Okay. And please type in your questions. Um, one question is, does the average quote per part include multiple OEM dealers? in the bids, and yes, it does. We have uh, multiple OEM dealers can, uh, answering those bids, and so it is more than one, uh, usually uh, more than, than two and a half to three actually answering those bids. And hey, Greg, it's Blake. Uh, we've got another question yeah. that was emailed, and I'm gonna go ahead and read it to you. Um, okay. With many automobile manufacturers shifting to EV fleets, do you see OEM part sales spiking at least initially while aftermarket manufacturers play catch up? That's a great question. And, and the answer would be yes, absolutely. Anytime uh, a new vehicle uh, or new vehicle type comes to market, uh, and Tesla is a great example, there is zero uh, aftermarket capability in the market now uh, for Tesla vehicles. The aftermarket manufacturers have to weigh a couple of factors before making that investment to, to engineer that, that uh, replacement part. And that is, what's the potential market sales for this vehicle? How many potential uh, vehicles can be sold? And then what's the length of the styling of, of and the life expectancy of that vehicle style? Um, so when we look at that, those all weigh in uh, in a big way on, on what we would see in the market. We've got one more related to EVs, um, it's a more general question. Uh, in what ways is the advent of EV shifting and changing the collision repair industry as a whole? Another great question. Um, as I mentioned, it's, it's really around uh, repairability. Um, and what we need to look at is the, the difference in engineering, and I'll bring out two great examples. You know, Tesla, I have the highest respect for the Tesla vehicle. I think they're phenomenal vehicles. Um, 
I do not believe that these were vehicles that were fully designed for collision repairability. And what I mean by that is when back in my General Motors days, we had a committee. I sat on the committee for insurance collision repairability. So we would look at, at specific issues of, gee, does this design uh, help or hinder the collision repair? Um, and to not to pick on Tesla, but this is a great example. When you look at a Tesla Model S and it has the lower control arm that needs to be replaced, the way that the uh, rear control arm mounting bolt was mounted, uh, it you cannot fully remove that lower control arm without partially lowering that battery piece. It takes what could be a potentially 30 minute removal of that bolt and makes it a three to four hour process. So it will be interesting to see the advent of EVs and the engineering of those EVs and to, to see that future models and, and like the, the GM delivery truck, is that going to be part of the engineering with the idea of repairability? Uh, the answer is with Tessa, it, it, you know, it, it was really not part of the development of that architecture of that vehicle. Um, so I think that as we get more manufacturers um, looking at developing EVs, are they gonna do it like Mercedes does in parallel where they have the new vehicle with the gasoline engine as well as the corresponding EV vehicle? And then the only variances you have are around the battery location and the particularly vulnerable components of that EV that would potentially add to cost. But when you look at fresh architecture, like the Tesla, potentially like the, the GM electric van, was the architecture of that vehicle, did they actually consider collision repairability when they designed that vehicle? And uh, we don't know that answer right now. Okay. Well, that's all we've got on the emailed in ones. Oh, it looks like one more just came in for you, Greg, in the question. Great. Um, yeah, no. yeah, it's, it's a long read. one. <laughs> <laughs> you want to you want to just read it, uh, read it out loud, Greg. It's 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 a it's a bit of a bit of a novel. Uh, that's okay, actually, Blake. If you could read it, because I'm having yep. a problem. Maybe yep. it's my age. I can't really. Uh... <laughs> it, it's all good. Uh, this is from Eric Taylor. He says, Greg, on the quotes per vehicle vehicle Altima versus F150. A huge part of the imbalance is due to patents on the F-150 parts. The free market availability of these parts is very limited in the aftermarket. LKQ controls all parts flow in the uh, aftermarket due to its agreement with Ford. This hinders quoting a great deal. Most likely, it is not that the aftermarket is slow to the market on aluminum production. It is just that their ROI is so much less than years gone by. The F-150 yeah. was by far the uh, highest selling group of AM parts. Your thoughts? Great meeting, by the way. Yeah, thank you, Eric, and I appreciate the the kind words. Yeah, it's in in what I mentioned that the aftermarket was not getting into the manufacture of aluminum parts, um, in particular in relation to the F one hundred and fifty. It is around uh, their their patent agreements, um, and as we look at aluminum parts in the future and all parts in general, the impact of patents is going to play a huge role. Uh, on the effectiveness of that type of part being available uh, for replication in the aftermarket. Um, Ford, as we know, has always been uh, very protective of their parts. They did it the old school way with the Mustang GT where they would stamp the logo in the rear bumper uh, to prohibit that type of, of replication in the aftermarket. Um, I think these patents that they filed on these parts around intellectual property um, do help protect them from the aftermarket. But um, the the slight relief that we can offer with Parts Trader is that competitive tension on the OE side. So we would have uh, competing uh, OE uh, parts departments uh, bidding for that part. Hope that answers your question. Again, if if anybody has a uh, a question that they want to share or thoughts or opinions, 
uh, please email me at greg.horn at partstrader.com and I'd be happy to answer your questions. All right, uh, any final questions? Blake, I don't see any. I was finally able to uh, adjust the uh, resolution so I could actually read these questions. Uh, <laughs> I think we're all good. And Greg, just, just on the email, it's greg.horn at partstrader.us.com, correct? No, um, just, I am one of the few people just because just apparently I'm, I'm global. Um, <laughs> it is just partstrader.com. So yeah. And I, uh, I went ahead and dropped that in the chat for anybody that wants to, wants to have that for right. later. Yep, I, uh, I carry the honor of carrying the first person to have just partstrader.com because uh, we are we are expanding in many markets, <laughs> and uh, so it, it came in handy to have a, a full across the board. Very All right, folks. Um, I appreciate it very much. Again, I am humbled by your willingness to attend, uh, and I look forward to answering your questions. And stay tuned, we will bring a, uh, another industry update uh, in the middle of the second quarter. We haven't settled it on dates yet, but we look to bring those out very soon. So uh, keep your eyes and ears open and please register. I appreciate very, very much your time. Uh, thank you very much and have a great rest of the day. <laughs>